<laughs> All right, you all are doing great. It's been a long day, but an exciting day. I will say just um, compared to last year, it's amazing how much has changed. And part of the reason I really enjoy prostate cancer is because it is rapidly evolving. And it's courses like this that help us all stay on top of best patient care and make sure that we have, we're have we maximizing outcomes for our patients. I feel a certain amount of pressure to um, start off with a joke. And I have one urology joke. So if you know me, you've probably heard it before. But how can you tell by looking at an EKG that a patient has hypospadias? Inverted P waves. All right. So good, right? I work at um, Vanderbilt, and I have the, the good pleasure of working with um, Dr. Kelvin Moses, who you've already heard from today. The two of us uh, staff our Advanced Prostate Cancer Clinic, and we work very closely with our medical oncologists and also a great um, palliative care team, radiation oncologists. Our specialty pharmacy is, is top notch, and um, I've learned so much just uh, in, in helping care for patients in that clinic. So we'll get started here. I'll be talking about PARP inhibitors and microsatellite instability. These are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to advanced prostate cancer. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about precision medicine before getting into genetic mutations. I know you've heard so much about genetic mutations, and if there's one take-home message you have from today, it is that you need to be testing um, for genetic mutations in your advanced prostate cancer patients because it really can um, impact the treatments that you offer and their responses to therapy. We'll talk about the approved PARP inhibitor agents, microsatellite instability, um, and then uh, finish up talking about some additional agents that can be used in this space. I was glad to see I used the same graphics as uh, Dr. Heath. Um, so this nice patient here, he has prostate cancer, but prostate cancer is not one size fits all, and we've learned so much about the differences that can occur. Um, even this morning, just learning about different nomograms and biomarker tests that we can use to risk stratify our patients. There is also genomic profiling of patient tumors, which can help us individualize care. We know that there are certain mutations that mean a patient will have a more aggressive disease course and that they will respond preferentially to specific treatments. So we really need to be trying to individualize care for our patients. This helps inform our practice, the decisions we make, and uh, changes our outcomes potentially for our patients. When a patient has genomic instability, that is one of the many possible causes for cancer. We are fortunate to have evolved very advanced um, systems of repair, one of which is DNA damage response. These uh, pathways identify and repair and help our cells maintain stability. However, when we have defective DNA repair systems, then cancer can develop and progress. We've already demonstrated clearly that prostate cancer has a strong genetic association, particularly when it comes to homologous recombination repair gene deficient prostate cancers. And we know now that upwards of um, you know, 20, 25% of patients with advanced prostate cancer may harbor um, these mutations. So since 2016, as um, we heard this morning, there have been really ex expanded recommendations for genetic testing. That is so critical for providing personalized medicine and individualized care for our patients. The updated guideline from 2023 recommends that we at least offer, if not already performed, uh, both germline and somatic testing to identify several different mutations, DNA repair deficiencies, microsatellite instability, uh, and tumor mutational burden because of prognosis, because of potential targeted therapies, and then cascade testing. So it may benefit 
other family members if there is a mutation identified to undergo testing so that if they also have a specific mutation, they can undergo um, additional screening and earlier intervention that can improve outcomes. Now, I put this up here for a couple of reasons. I know it's kind of overwhelming and there's a lot of words on this slide, but it speaks to uh, some of what Dr. Heath just highlighted, that this space has changed so much. And again, this chart um, last year did not look like this, but I think when there are so many options and it does change so rapidly, it's helpful to kind of compartmentalize things. So when we're considering patients who have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, determining what we give them is based on several things. First and foremost, what are the prior therapies they have had? So if a patient comes to us without any prior chemotherapy and without any prior novel hormonal therapy, there are these recommended agents. If a patient has had prior novel hormonal therapy and progressed but no prior docetaxel, here's what you should consider. If a patient has progressed on um, prior novel hormonal therapy but not docetaxel, offer these. And then finally, we have patients who arrive in our clinic who have undergone both of those therapies and progressed through both of those therapies. Here's what you should offer them. And kind of reiterating some of what you just heard, it goes beyond that. You have to also consider the patient in front of you. What is their performance status? Are they having significant symptoms? And are those symptoms related to their advanced cancer? And then of course, genetic testing. So genetic testing impacts where they fit in these little boxes as well. So rapidly changing landscape, a lot to consider, but breaking it down and categorizing uh, our patients, although no one fits into totally discrete boxes like this, is really very helpful. So PARP inhibitors. First, we have to consider what PARPs are. PARPs are a class of enzymes that do two things. They recognize when there's DNA damage and they recruit other helpers to come and repair that damage. PARP inhibitors are a very attractive um, agent to help um, combat that um, and shut it down so that cells that are defective or cancer cells aren't allowed to um, progress and survive and replicate. Um, and so there are really two ways that PARP inhibitors work. One way is something called PARP trapping, where the PARP inhibitor will bind where the PARP enzyme would have um, connected and prevents that recognition and recruitment of um, repair systems. And the other is really important in advanced prostate cancer, and that's synthetic lethality. So I think of it kind of like a, a two-hit hypothesis where you already have damaged cells, and then you bring in this inhibitor that blocks the secondary or dependent pathway that prevents any um, survival. It's irreparable damage to the cell, resulting in cancer cell death. PARPs can be given as single agents, which we'll talk about first, or they can also be given in combination, as we just heard. So in the single agent setting, there are two FDA-approved agents, and these were approved in advance of the updated AUA guideline, and hence they are in the updated guideline. The combinations came after. So um, as our guidelines tell us, we should offer PARP inhibitors to patients who have deletions or suspected deletions in germline or somatic HRR mutated metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer in patients who have had prior therapy and failed, so either enzalutamide or abiraterone or chemotherapy. Also of note, for patients who aren't eligible or cannot obtain a PARP inhibitor, platinum-based chemotherapy can be offered as an alternative. So let's first talk about the PROFOUND trial. This is for Laparib, a phase three randomized control trial where patients were given 300 milligrams of Laparib twice daily versus physician's choice, which was based on whatever prior therapy they had received. Patients here had progressed on either abiraterone or enzalutamide 
and may or may not have seen a taxane. It was not required. All patients here had an HRR mutation, and they were broken out into two different cohorts. We have cohort A, patients who had BRCA1 or 2 or ATM mutations. And then the second cohort B had mutations in at least one of 12 other HRR um, mutation genes. <clears throat> the primary endpoint here is radiographic progression-free survival, which we see commonly in the testing of PARP inhibitors. Um, results here show that for cohorts A and B, there's uh, an advantage to a laparib with a hazard ratio of 0 0.49. But when we look just at cohort A, the BRCA 1 and 2 cohort, we do see a more favorable hazard ratio. Uh, we can also see the interim overall survival analysis, which is favoring um, olaparib. And we saw the FDA approval for this in May of uh, 2020 based on these results. So what about rucaparib? Uh, rucaparib first was um, studied in a phase two setting, and actually it was not a randomized control trial. It was an open-label, single-arm uh, study. Um, patients here had metastatic CRPC and prior novel hormonal therapy as well as a taxane. Um, here we saw a primary endpoint of objective response rate in patients who had measurable disease and also a secondary endpoint of median radiographic progression-free survival as well as other important endpoints like time to PSA progression, overall survival, and duration of response. Um, so in this trial, we saw favorable results with, um, excuse me, in this study, we saw favorable results with uh, rucaparib that resulted in an FDA approval based on phase two data. The um, two different um, figures here show the radiographic response as well as the PSA response um, for patients treated with uh, rucaparib. And then we see the final analysis here where patients who had BRCA mutations actually, um, and not surprisingly, uh, fared better. So this confirmed the clinical benefit um, of rucaparib in this setting with uh, also a manageable safety profile for these patients. So then phase three follow-up trial, this um, was looking, the Triton three trial, again at uh, rucaparib for patients who had BRCA1, 2, or ATM and prior novel hormonal therapy, did not require taxane exposure previously. And again, this trial was two to one rucaparib versus physician's choice, primary endpoint the same, radiographic progression-free survival. Um, and we see here that the results favored treatment with rucaparib in all comers, actually, but we see a, a really strong uh, result for patients who had prior, um, had the mutation, the HRR mutation. Um, so we're seeing a theme here where patients who harbor these mutations do better with the PARP inhibitors. So that's in isolation. So using those medications um, in kind of a secondary setting after prior therapy and alone. But what about co combining um, PARP inhibitors with androgen receptor pathway inhibitors? Well, it's based on preclinical data, but we have evidence that um, the PARP impacts the androgen receptor, and the androgen receptor can have an effect on the DNA repair mechanisms. So using these two together um, induces sort of a synergism in what I've seen called a, like a BRCA-like state. So there is for sure crosstalk between these two agents and perhaps may, even in patients who don't have a BRCA mutation, we may one day see a benefit using these two in combination. As I go through the data, you'll see that actually the mutation is still quite important for um, the most favorable outcomes with uh, PARP inhibitors. But there is some sort of crosstalk here that um, makes the response even more effective. 
The combination studies that I will uh, go through are Propel, so Olaparib and Abiraterone, Magnitude, Niraparib and Abiraterone, and then Talazoparib and Enzalutamide for Talapro. There are, as you heard earlier, other combinations that are being explored in this state, but also earlier on in the disease course. And that is kind of a common theme in advanced prostate cancer, where we see something being utilized in the kind of end stage, and then it moves up a little bit earlier, and then it moves up a little bit earlier. So that may also be the case with uh, PARP inhibitors. So um, first, um, we will talk about Propel here. Um, prior to Propel, there was a phase two randomized control trial looking at abiraterone and olaparib versus abiraterone in placebo. Uh, radiographic progression-free survival was evaluated in these patients who had previously received docetaxel. And we saw a benefit in this um, study, which kind of laid the groundwork for the Propel, which is a phase three trial, abiraterone plus olaparib, again, with the control arm being abiraterone plus placebo. Um, patients were enrolled here, importantly, regardless of their HRR status, um, and that is certainly important and has resulted in some exciting debates at some uh, oncology meetings that I have attended. Uh, but we see here that patients could have had docetaxel in the hormone-sensitive space, but patients were untreated in the metastatic castration-resistant state. So this is first line. Not only is it combination, but first line for metastatic CRPC. Primary endpoint here is image-based progression-free survival by investigator assessment in the intention to treat analysis. And results showed a significantly longer recurrence-free survival with the combination. And this was even um, more significant for patients who had HRR mutations. Uh, presented last year at GU ASCO was the overall safety, um, sorry, overall survival and uh, safety data. And again, we see great results, particularly and most significantly in the patients who had BRCA mutations. Moving on to talazoparib, there um, first uh, I first saw talazoparib being evaluated um, in the the in a phase in a phase two trial, open label phase two trial. This was actually used as um, monotherapy, but in patients with metastatic CRPC who had progressed um, and had measurable soft tissue disease as well as prior. Um, hormone therapy um, and taxane therapy, we saw a, an overall an objective response rate um, that favored the talazoparib. So that kind of, I feel, laid the groundwork for um, further studies that have led to FDA approvals. So we have Talapro-2, which is talazoparib plus enzalutamide versus enzalutamide and placebo. These patients were untreated in this double-blind phase three trial. They were stratified at randomization by their HRR status, as well as any prior therapy that they had received. Primary endpoint here was radiographic progression-free survival in the intention to treat group. Really impressive survival outcomes. We see a 77% decreased risk of radiographic progression-free survival and death in BRCA mutated patients versus only a 34% decrease in patients who were non-BRCA mutated. So this is what led to the FDA approval in June of last year. And then finally, um, niraparib and abiraterone um, for this patient population. This is a phase three randomized uh, double-blind trial. <clears throat> Again, the, that, that um, control arm is abiraterone plus placebo. And patients here in the um, hormone-sensitive state could have received um, novel hormonal therapy. Um, also enrolled were M0 CRPC patients, but no one in the M1 CRPC space had received any primary therapy, so this is um, primary treatment for them. And we see uh, improvements in radiographic progression-free survival, um, particularly for the BRCA1 and 2 mutated patients, and improvements um, as well in patients who had any HRR mutation. But in the non-mutated patients, 
futile, no, no benefit to um, the combination here. And then we see the kind of long-term, longer-term results here with um, the radiographic progression-free survival, then uh, also time to symptomatic progression as well as um, initiation of cytotoxic chemotherapy. So really important secondary outcomes. So what about adverse events with PARP inhibitors? Um, I think when we're considering these, it's important to consider which trials we're looking at the adverse events in, because when we're thinking about the first two trials of Olaparib and Rucaparib, those patients were heavily pretreated, right? They had had a number of different therapies, and so potentially their, um, their toxicity um, may have been greater than if we're using it kind of earlier in the disease course. So have to consider that. But in general, myelosuppression is one of the major um, adverse events associated with PARP inhibitors, particularly anemia. Um, patients may have to have their, um, their treatments held while they receive transfusions and then resumed at, at lower doses. We can also see thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. Other side effects um, common to any kind of therapy in, in its advanced stage, stage like this, um, fatigue, GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, um, and then less commonly but still quite important and should be screened for are venous thromboembolism and pneumonitis. And then we heard uh, earlier about the importance of having um, myelodysplastic syndrome on your differential as you're evaluating these patients um, because that, that can occur. So how do we manage these? Um, certainly if the PARP appears to be working, you don't want to have to stop and switch therapy. So interrupting the dose and holding off and then um, treating your patient's symptoms uh, and then starting back up at a lower dose to make sure that they're able to tolerate it, I think is what is commonly done in practice and we may hear more about that um, in the next talk. There are other mutations. It's not just all about PARP. Um, there can be microsatellite instability, which we have heard a little bit about. Um, so one of the other ways that our bodies can um, combat, you know, insults is the mismatch repair um, mechanism. So this is post-replicative single-strand uh, repair mechanism. So using this system, we're able to recognize and reverse mismatches, insertions, and deletions, and then continue on with the cell's proper function. But um, MSI is a result of this system being broken. What does that mean for us? Well, for many patients, that means they have chemotherapy resistance, uh, but however, we do see that some of these patients will respond to immunotherapy. And uh, there was a large case series of over 1,000 patients with advanced prostate cancer who uh, were evaluated, and about 3% of that population did have um, MSI mutations, and when exposed to IO therapy, had a favorable response, particularly a PSA response. And so based on that, we have been um, utilizing immunotherapy in advanced prostate cancer in select situations. So we know in renal cell carcinoma, in urothelial carcinoma, we've seen really meaningful clinical benefit with immunotherapy, but that has not been the case in advanced prostate cancer. In 2017, the FDA did approve pembrolizumab for patients who have these mutations and have no other alternatives. That is reflected in the guidelines. So in patients who have mismatch repair deficient or microsatellite instability high lesions, in the metastatic CRPC state, we should offer pembrolizumab. This is interestingly based um, on these five um, studies that enrolled heterogeneous um, populations. So they had 15 different cancers, um, and some some patients responded with solid tumors, giving this message that you know maybe it's it's agnostic to the site of origin, but there are certain tumors across a diverse um, group of, of cancers um, that have 
similar biology and may respond to um, pembrolizumab rather than, you know, again, what the primary site of origin is. And that's how we see um, pembrolizumab being used in advanced prostate cancer. So these are the five clinical trials that I had mentioned before with 15 different cancers, including, including prostate cancer. Then third line agents, we heard this morning about lutetium being utilized for patients who have metastatic CRPC with prior therapy, both docetaxel and novel hormonal therapy, and PSMA PET positive lesions. And then um, we heard uh, about um, cabazitaxel in the last talk by Dr. Heath. Um, so just to show you this curve again for patients who have um, who were enrolled in the vision trial and received lutetium, we see uh, improvements in image-based progress progression-free survival as well as overall survival. Um, leading to its use, and then finally, cabazitaxel. So the three important studies that were highlighted before, this is certainly um, an, a later option for patients with metastatic CRPC. So kind of putting it all together, um, as you're, you're going through and considering how best to manage your patient, I find thinking about what prior therapies have they received, what are the results of their genetic testing? And if you haven't done it, then do the genetic testing then. And what is their symptom burden? What are their comorbidities? And then based on that, piecing together what your patient should receive. And I guarantee you that next year when we have this same symposium, um, this chart will look a little bit different, but um, the factors that we consider will likely remain the same. And I think that's it. Thank you.